um, yesterday I didn't have the privilege of saying ladies, so it feels very good to welcome the ladies in here today. Um, we had a very wonderful session uh, yesterday. Uh, we had uh, participants who were very keen about Nigeria and had very, very um, valuable question to ask uh, Honourable uh, our Honourable Mr. Dati sitting down here today. Um, he's been very kind enough to return today for more questioning. As we all know, um, he's one of the aspirants for uh, the presidential position in Nigeria. So he's meeting with uh, citizens of Nigeria to find out from them what, what, what are their thoughts about Nigeria as a country, what are their expectations from a man who holds that position of president of Nigeria. So what we are here today is to meet with him on a one-to-one -one and to ask him the questions face-to-face. -face. So um, I would open the floor by asking if there's anything you want to say to the attendees today. Hello, welcome, or just <laughs> go straight into it. Hello, welcome, <laughs> <laughs> and I hope we have a very good session. Mrs. Tayo Uriri. And I'm a supply teacher. I'm a teacher, train teacher in the UK, and I teach and supply bees. I also tutor children. Um, sorry, my glasses. <laughs> well, I said I read online about one of the reasons you built your university, which was because the educational standard in Nigeria was very poor. So, do you think it is important to replan the national, the Nigerian national curriculum to suit Nigeria? And also, if you're president, do you intend, how do you intend to go about improving the standards of the public education in Nigeria, of the public school education in Nigeria? Thank you very much for that. It's not to rewrite, it's to modify. Yeah, we discussed this yesterday, and uh, the gentleman actually said we should decolonize the curriculum. And I, I believe we should. Uh, as a matter of survival, we should. How I intend to develop the educational sector is a, is a question that can be asked from each and every sphere of life, from each and every sector. And it called from up initial a strategy that touch one area that affects all. Uh, you, you being in education will ask this. Somebody being in security will ask a similar one. Somebody being in tourism, somebody being in health will continue to ask. Yesterday we went as far as the DNA of good governance in which I mimicked the GTAC uh, into different things. But let me put it this way. There are generic issues that cut across everything. And if you solve those issues, they are touching each and every one. Fundamental among them is procurement. And uh, I said uh, from the Eagle Square, a responsible Nigerian leader who wishes to turn Nigeria around should announce, must announce, that he intends, he has at that point in time ended what we call inflated government contracts. Without doing this, there is no new Nigeria. Without doing this, there is no rebirth in Nigeria. There is no turnaround. It is something that affects from the security around you to the air you breathe. That includes education you're talking about and each and every sphere of life. Um, yesterday, I used the analogy of a tapeworm in the intestine of Nigeria, which eats away 90% of our nourishment. If one billion naira is spent on teacher welfare or teaching equipment, you will be lucky to get 100 million to do the job. Now the tapeworm is eating it away. How does it happen? It's through inflated government contracts. The moment you solve that, you have turned Nigeria around. I was, there have been at least a thousand members in the National Assembly, in the Fourth Republic. I do not know of anyone who has sponsored a direct assault on this phenomena. I sponsored the prohibition of inflated government contracts bill 2004. So if you were going online, I expect you to find 
high value information like that. Now, I, I am not uh, one in a million. I'm just ordinary. I'm just another one. Yeah, but the fundamentals of good governance that you touch will answer most of the questions in our respective sectors. So as part of the, the answers I will give you is reform of procurement will solve the better part of the problems. Two, I am one who works with professionals. And even though I'm into education, I don't arrogate myself knowing all the problems. So I will enroll uh, consultants, advisors, but not in a long bureaucratic way. <laughs> Sim we sit down today, discuss and we're actioning it tomorrow, straight to the point. So I will seek advice from all and sundry, the education council, the education bureaucracy, but without taking me on a roller coaster ride, including the education diaspora. If you have anything, I believe I'm someone who is very, very easily accessible wherever I am, whatever office I'm holding. There must be a way for me to connect to citizens. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, the lady. Next. Thank you. Um, Honorable Senator, I want to find out what plans you have for the solid minerals industry in Nigeria. We've heard so much about government's plans and it looks like this continuous illegal mining in all aspects of the industry. I don't know what plans you have to curb this and to really harness the mineral resources that we have. My name is Lydia Dusu. I'm a geologist retired from ExxonMobil. It's okay, good. You remind, do you know Chris Tucker, the comedian? Yeah. When he said, do you know I'm black? Yeah. You remember that comedy? Yeah. <laughs> do, do you know I'm a Nigerian? <laughs> now see, there are some answers which I always know the people who are asking the questions are not going to be happy with my answers. So I begin by giving you an apology. But then I'll justify why my answer is so bad. I'm not going to give you a good answer. Ab initial, I will tell you this. The reason is that, do you know we're in a bad situation? And that bad situation, solid minerals at the moment is the least of my worry. It's not that it was something we know, it's not we're going to ignore it, no. Solid minerals, for God's sake, is the least of our worries. When you have <laughs> communities at war, with themselves, and when you have your territory under occupation by terror, when you have sophisticated crimes on uh, sub-regional highways, regional highways, in broad daylight for hours, armed robbers operating and uh, kidnapping people in broad daylight, it makes solid minerals child's play. Now, if you meet a cowboy politician, if you meet the typical Nigerian politician, he will tell you he's going to do all and everything beyond solid minerals. Oh, solid minerals, yeah, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. Uh, you ask him about NASA, yes, Nigeria will join NASA and go to, go to. You ask him about legal aid for the villagers uh, in, in, in the hamlets of villages, they will tell you all and everything. But please, bear with me, madam, I'm not one of those. No way. I can only say what I plan to do. And in the next four years, if we solve our security challenges and, okay, take care of the economic fundamentals and strategic products, that is it. Now, I will repeat, it is not that we're going to ignore solid minerals. No. The same question was asked to me about power. And I said, power is for the private sector. The same thing, solid minerals are pro for the private sector. The government can no longer ever be efficient in investing uh, into solid minerals anymore. 
what are the fundamentals you see if we in summary solve eliminate terror minimize sophisticated crimes okay enhance public order that's on the, and then make it possible for nigerians travel to let's have our country back right now nigeria is not ours travel to anywhere in nigeria any hour of the day like you would anywhere absolutely then you have your country back and you can invest in solid minerals madam you can i know you can so solve the security challenges and then re-engineer the economic fundamentals what are they stabilize the naira and let the world know that 12 15 possibly beyond that the naira is not going to fluctuate by more than five percent the way you met it is the way you're going to leave it you will not come back in two years and it is half its value like buhari did to us no that won't happen one two interest rates get all macro variables in your favor tilt the balance that everything is now in favor of funds flowing into nigeria with our kind of interest rates i assure you we can tilt it in such a way that you can release equity from your properties in the uk at three percent and be making six percent in nigeria that's hundred percent profit paper paper the second advantage is that in nigeria now we're getting six percent you can lend at 10 11 12 percent that is for you short-term uh, investors they can also get two and a half to three and a half sometimes four percent which they can lend at six seven eight maybe nine percent uh, in the bank so drive down interest rates when you get the and you mitigate flug, uh, exchange fluctuation risks you mitigate uh, civic risks and then business risks. If you are able to do this, the last but not the least is to ensure living wage for Nigeria. And I mentioned killing what we call contractual crazy. It's like taking from those fat uh, cows. What do you call it? The business people from the tapeworm that is eating away, okay? And now you are paying public servants legitimate income. So they have more money to spend, which they cannot keep. It goes, of course, to oiling the machinery of the private sector. These are the economic fundamentals. You are not paying it to the bourgeoisie or allowing the bourgeoisie to fritter it away. It is the average Harry who works nine to five that you are now increases his legitimate income. And if you have been following my trend, at substantial risk, I have been saying this. And uh, I went to the extent of saying that the salaries of June 2019 will be literally 50% more than May 2019. And the balance of 250% to make it quadruple will be spread over 47 months so that at the end of four years, what you earned at the beginning is now literally four times more, which is 300% more. And I'm not a dreamer. I know where the money is. At least I've been in the appropriations committee. Five budgets I worked, uh, I worked on. I know where the money is. The way we structure government, we can even have a Minister of State Finance strictly in charge of remuneration. We're not going to have the kind of structure that you know. Minister of Tourism, Minister of Culture, Minister of... No, no, no. It's com a completely different kind of structure and issues we're doing. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the gentleman in blue and then the lady... Honorable Senator, my name is Lanre Gabriel Owulabi. I am an entrepreneur here. I have a, my own kitchen company and I do featured kitchens. I'm, I'm actually branching into Nigeria, taking orders from Nigeria now. 
and that's my goal and my intention. A few questions. Uh, um, we know being the president is a very lonely job because you have to make decisions, yeah? And they might, they, they might not be favorable with many people. So the easiest thing to do in Rock, we know is to attract smart policy advisors, yeah? How do we know that you know enough to not just accept what they say? And many of the decisions in Rock won't be consensus. What will inform your, your decision making? We want to know what you will inform your decision making because there are so many factions. Uh, we want to know what will in, inform your decision making so that you will be fair to all. Thank you. Thank you Larry. Yeah. There are two things, situation and vision that will inform decision. I look at the situation on ground and match that with the vision that I, I came with. And that is what will drive the decision process. What will feed the decision process uh, is for the leader okay, to work with the best team and the best team to enroll stakeholders. Then they work with national interests, group interests, and uh, find the way forward. There cannot be a specific answer at the moment because you are asking me a, a, a hypothetical question on what the process is. So I cannot apply it to sector or product or any issue. It's a generic kind of question. And uh, I think this is the best way to approach that kind of situation. Uh, the process should begin with a clear situation analysis like the one I have now. And yesterday, somebody said that uh, the present government came with no agenda. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We have a clear agenda. And uh, every decision that is taken is going to stem from that agenda. And I went to the extent of saying, if you ask me in one sentence, what is your governance strategy? It's to use quality education and training to build the economy that will solve our security challenges. I dare you to go way back in time to find out all elected governments, if they had a short, simple, practical, understandable governance strategy from which you can base all your decisions from. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll take the lady over here. Rose OB, um, I'm a solicitor and currently a housewife. Um, I have two questions. One is actually from my daughter who, who had just finished her, her A-levels in politics and economics. Do pardon me, I forgot my glasses, but I'll try and read out what she, you know, what she sent me. What do you think are the most significant areas that hold Nigeria back from economic development? And how can you com combat these? And my question, mine, how would you combat the security challenges prevalent in the country right, right now? And if I add a little, just a, one more, how do you hope to dislodge Buhari if we all um, hopefully support you and you've, you know, you've got us on side, um, given the power of incumbency? Thank you. I like, I like, I like. <laughs> Say hi to your daughter first. <laughs> and I admire her courage, you know. Yeah, at least she's, uh, in, in the future, will you allow her to come and contest uh, State Assembly or House of Reps in Nigeria? Okay, good. <laughs> How to solve the, what, sorry, what are the things holding us back? Yes. Our economy back. Significant areas that hold Nigeria back from economic development. One is the poor, the weak, and declining currency. You can enumerate them to her. Okay. I also did economics. Okay. Yeah. Mm. The weak and depreciating currency. One. Two, 
which is partly economic and partly governance issue, is the um, inappropriate or unfavorable procurement system that we have. Three is very low disposable income, which is responsible for weak domestic demand. Four, we can see bad governance that has led to poor economic infrastructure. Five, poor support services. Six, difficult lending environment and high interest rate. Seven, shortage of skills. And please tell her that I have given her an assignment to fill all the blanks. Take those as, and has she done master's degree yet? She just finished her A-levels. Oh. <laughs> I, I think she will add uh, tribalism, because she was saying she read Deloitte um, report that just came out. And <coughs> I'm sorry. Remove, remove tribalism. Okay. It won't work. It won't work. Mm, it won't work. Um, tell her this is very good uh, assignment for her. You know, she can take them as bullet points and build, build on them. Like skeleton, fill it up and send to me. I'll be, I'll be glad to be her teacher. Okay, security. When I'm asked in public back in Nigeria, because we hardly have these kind of situations, I normally say that I don't discuss security in, in public. So this is not public, this is uh, private. Now, again, on the same principles that I answered, madam, security is very unique because if you don't have somebody that is officially, formally, and fully briefed about the situation, and he tells you what the situation is, he's a liar. APC played politics with Nigeria's security. And that's how they got everything wrong. What do I know about Boko Haram, if not what I read in the pages of newspapers? Madam, I'm as good as you. And this is the fact of life. Well, maybe I know a little more. But it's not formal and it's not official. And you stand the risk of being wrong. So it is a matter of goodwill and attitude and capacity. Day one, the first thing is get the full briefing. Where is the file? Bring it. Sit down, talk. But I can tell you, as a layman, all I know is principle one, cycle the territory. The moment you, in principle, once you have insurgency, there is institutional support to every kind of insurgency. Once your enemy holds ground, you are halfway to de defeating because you, you will have to know where they are. What's the next? You encircle them. Encircle them, cut supplies. That is the tactical battle. The army, whatever you have, even if it means they advance, okay, one kilometer a day. In, in, in 30 days, they would have closed in 60 kilometers. And I don't believe your cycle is going to be more than 60 kilometers. It is enough punishment to cut supplies for that long. The second thing is intelligence war. Continue picking and dislodging all their support and their links of supplies, money, and everything local, national, and within. The route of supplying uh, weapons, fuel, food, so on, money, so on and so forth, you continue doing it. This again is the war, immediate war. Then friends who are in education, we need to make a heavy onslaught on reintegrating and then promoting education 
with a vengeance and then releasing money that I, be, I believe in oiling the economy. That's why I don't mind. We cut the unnecessary profit in the government wasteful ventures and push it into the real economy. Push trillions into the economy. Who, who should go to the private sector? The economy of the Northeast at one point had less than 1% of the entire credit in Nigeria. So there is very little wonder why insurgency will come from there. Give a lot of credit. Let the economy get going. There's only one building in the entire northeastern Nigeria that is several story high. Six states in the third millennium, only one building that I know. And I think it's nine story. The hotel in the 19, was built 1982-83. Since then, never. So economy, education, use that on the soft part of the war. Then fight them. But beyond that, let me tell you, whoever tells you, I have never sat with DSS, I have never sat with the Security Council, until they sit down and read the file, and really, really, this is what happened. How many are they in number? Okay? What kind of weapons do they have? How did they come about those weapons? How many captives? For how all the technical questions, and then you begin to unravel. But meet any politician that will sit down with you and tell you, ah, we're going to finish them. I know it's a lie. It's a lie. And I'm, I keep apologizing. I'm not going to lie to anybody because I want, I want your votes. This is just the fact. Until they brief me, I don't know. I'm only as good as you. But I have the attitude and the capacity to work with everyone who will add value to that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, how will I dislodge Buhari? <laughs> With your kind support. <laughs> uh, unless if somebody is going to fall from heaven, or we're going to admit UK citizens to come and contest elections in Nigeria, the cards are on the table. And I believe when you know a good deal you see one when you see a good deal you know one when you see a bad deal you know you know it if you see a time waster you know and so on and so forth uh, buhari is almost the candidate for apc and uh, we don't think any party beyond pdp it's likely be realistically going to form the next government. We can see it in the last election. The two political parties had 99% of the vote, and between the two of them, there was only 20,000, which is like less than 1% difference uh, in the votes. That's to show you how, so really there are two political parties that are contesting the presidency. Now, if Buhari is for APC, and the PDP has zoned for now to the north, which is constitutional and is political. We discussed this in detail yesterday. Because Nigeria is a complex federation of families that decide, you do, we do, you do, we do. Okay? And it's now decided that, okay, for now, the party has decided to zone it to the north. And the north almost micro-zoned to the northwest. Why? One, Bahari is from the northwest. So they want somebody from where he is to break the backbone of his support. Two, because that's where you have the highest number of vote, registered voters, 18 million. Northeast has nine, and the North Central has, I think, 11 million registered uh, voters. 186 million sounds like a big number. In reality, it's not a big number. And we can work it out now because if you apply constitutional, political, and social elimination criteria, 
you will find out that we're down to about six people. It just so happens that I have ticked all the boxes and I have, and I happen to be among those six. Elimination criteria number one, the Nigerian constitution says you need to be 40 years and above. Number two, you need to have the GCO level. So that 40 years and above, if my demography doesn't fail me, you have eliminated 65%, right? So 186 million, now we're talking of 35% of that number. GCO level, divide that by two. And then the zoning to the Northwest, because of the population of the Northwest, instead of divide by six, you do it divide by five. Then we come to social criteria with due respect to the women. Okay, we're talking ideally a man, not a woman. You divide that by two again. Um, what else? In a society, how many people are minded to go into politics? Be card carrying members of a political party, want to contest, not councillor, not local government chairman, not state assembly, reps, governor, or senator, but president. Some people place it at one in 5,000. To be on the safe side, put it one in 2,000. And what is left, how many in the society can afford to shoulder the rigors of electioneering, form, logistics, etc., etc., without resorting to begging and, uh, and all those, and, uh, and entirely. So just use the GNI coefficient of the World Bank which is available online, let's use one in 100. By the time you finish all those, you're down to six people. You are dividing it 186 by a factor of all these things I've told you. Percentage of 40 years and above, GCO level, micro zoning to the Northwest, man, political experience, who has ever been elected? at least once, or contested an election, at least once. Because you don't want to bring out somebody who's nothing and say that he's going to lead a country of 186 million from not never elected. You must have reasonable ex uh, experience. political experience. If you were, to, this means if you were to give every Nigerian a form, 186 million, that if you tick all the boxes here, you must contest the presidency. I'm one of those who are left. And what happened again? Buhari, before realizing, kept eliminating my uh, opposition by AFCC. Until when they just realized last month, when they were going to pick one of the governors from my state. They said, no, 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 don't pick him yet. Leave him, let him spoil my chances. And then they can pick him up later and arrest him. You know, they can arrest him later and all that. So all the cards are on the table. You have a former vice president from the Northeast uh, who has issues that I don't want to mention now uh, around integrity. You have two governors who are currently almost weekly going to EFCC and going to court from the Northwest. You have another governor in the Northeast uh, who made an attempt but more or less has pulled back. You have one former minister who so far they have not been able to catch on anything. They tried uh, constituency projects, they tried short P and others, but they, they keep trying. And last but not the least is the governor they left. This is the governor that I defeated in for the Senate. And then he went to buy it back. Or, uh, sorry, he went to get it back. <laughs> uh, so they're leaving him for now. Now, I typically fit the new generation bill. And then uh, I have not been a governor or former vice president or anything. What politicians say, baggage. To the best of my knowledge, up till while we sit now, I don't know what, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I carry no baggage. But I don't know what they can go and come up with. So not to count my luck uh, too much. 
somebody was telling me, and he scared me. He said, everything is pointing at you. I said, that should make me run. Because a powerful government like the APC in a very unsafe environment like Nigeria, and you are the only credible threat to them, then you better be careful. Mm. So defeating Buhari, let me answer your question. If I get the PDP ticket, like I said when I went to declare my, to submit my letter of intent, if I get the PDP ticket, APC will not know what hit it. Believe me. The so-called integrity of Buhari will be shredded to pieces because they are corrupt. The kind of corruption we have not seen before in Nigeria. Yes, they are. And they, they played politics, lied to us about security. Nigeria is even more insecure now. Killings every day and they cannot unite Nigerians. What he does is to continue to divide Nigerians. No. It is barbaric to you know, anim animals compared with the lives of, uh, you know what I mean. I don't want to go too, too deep into that, you know. There is win-win situation for everybody in that. Cre creation of ranches, you will wipe out between one and a half to two million unemployed youth. And then they can now become friends when farmers are selling fodder to the and then, uh, again, the natives can be the landlords of the ranches. Protecting those who were fighting before now become friends. Mm. Simply because they don't have the idea of creating business. The next president of Nigeria must be a businessman. Mm. The next president of Nigeria must be ready to micromanage Nigeria. He must be a leader that doesn't feel he is about speeches, he is about appointments only, he is about policy, uh, or he is about framework. No. The next president of Nigeria must be somebody who is action today, result shortly afterwards. 